Okay, so now we are live. We're just waiting for one more minute and then we start the session. I can already see Claire Chen there. Hi, Claire. She's an old friend from the Razis community. Okay, so I think we could already get started. So uh, we are here with uh, some wonderful guests to talk about uh, some uh, pretty amazing topics regarding uh, Latin America. Uh, the topic of this panel is uh, resourceful Latin America. And the idea here is for us to discuss a little bit with experts in the in different uh, fields, different areas. And uh, uh, we, we want to go through here uh, a little bit about the uh, integrity and the social cohesion of the countries here in Latin America, uh, how the, the countries are facing this uh, challenging times that we are living. Uh, what are the perspectives in uh, redeveloping the countries? Uh, how the countries can cooperate together in order to, to create a better future, especially in the infrastructure, investments. And maybe we can tackle a little bit on, on fortune telling here and, and say a little bit what we think uh, might be uh, the outcome of this. And when will this happen? And so uh, for this, uh, we have some, some uh, nice guests here today. Well, my name is Mauricio, first of all. I'm the president of uh, IBRE, which is the Brazilian uh, Institution for International Business Relations. Uh, in our institute here, we uh, usually uh, work in uh, fostering the connections between Brazil and other markets. Uh, we deal with uh, different se sectors and different markets every day here. And uh, this has been really uh, an uh, interesting time to live in and a very challenging time. But uh, we've, been we've been seeing a, a lot of uh, interesting developments. And I hope we can, we can uh, go through some of these uh, things that we're li living and seeing here. Uh, throughout the conversations uh, in this panel today. So I will start with uh, Lloyd. So Lloyd Thomas, uh, he is uh, the managing partner of uh, Aten Capital. And he will talk a little bit about the, the foreign, uh, foreign direct investments uh, here in, in Latin America, especially the appetite from uh, the investors in UK and uh, and the European market, and how we can foster uh, the, the ESG goals here in investments here in Latin America also. And I believe you're going to talk a little bit about uh, external views on populism and how it's growing here also. No, Lloyd. So the room is yours. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and uh, and... Talk a little bit. Uh, I think we, we can uh, limit ourselves in three to five minutes for this uh, first presentation, and then we can uh, exchange a little bit of ideas uh, between ourselves. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, great to be here. Thank you so much, Mauricio. Um, uh, I'm the managing partner of Athene Capital. Athene Capital is based in London. We are an emerging markets focused investor. We invest in Latin America, Africa. Central Asia, uh, South South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Europe. Um, uh, we we invest um, in large projects, typically 50 million or above. We also invest uh, as a limited partner in uh, in private equity and private debt funds that are active in in, uh, in the region. So we go both direct and indirect. Um, uh, and we we've. 
it's very hard to talk about Latin America as a whole because I think that there's a huge amount of diversity within uh, within the continent, and I think that the, the, the situation is very different um, in in each country. We're probably among the most adventurous of of UK investors uh, in terms of you know we we looked at investing deep in in the jungle in, in Colombia before you know before the peace with the, with, with the FARC was was uh, ratified etc. Um, we are still uh, excited to invest in in Argentina where I think a lot of people have have uh, become a little bit more scared. Um, I think you know what what. Where we come from, from the UK, the government has been pushing, particularly post-Brexit, uh, stronger ties with Latin America. They recently had a virtual day with uh, on Peru uh, to promote investment. The issues that, that we're grappling with um, are mostly around the potential for regime change and, 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 and populism. That is, you know, we were... We were very bullish in Argentina when when Macri was around. Um, uh, that didn't that didn't last. Uh, we pr- we are always worried that that's going to happen in in every geography we in which we invest. You know, Br- Brazil similarly. Uh, we were very bullish a, a couple of years ago. We're we're still bullish today, but I think we're charging higher risk premiums. Um, and I think that the major challenge uh, for, for for all of these countries is to be able to demonstrate uh, to uh, to external investors on, on the foreign direct investment side that um, uh, that the investor protections that they put in uh, are hardwired and are here to stay and are not going to be repealed by by the next populist government so that's uh, uh, that, that's a brief summary of my views that's great thank you Lloyd um, and now I'm gonna move to Wilbert. Wilbert is managing director of the, uh, TCP Partners, and he will be talking a little bit about uh, restructuring in Latin America and in this uh, after COVID situation, and uh, especially the retaking the capital markets, and a little bit of his views in the recent uh, IPOs that's been happening here. So, Wilbert, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone else as well for, for assisting. Uh, my name is Wilbert. I'm at TCP Partners, and we really looked at the stress uh, in special sits. My background is from principal investing at Merrill Lynch, um, and uh, and we have a 25% group in, in Brazil that really looks mostly at the stress investing. We have an office in Mexico as well with B. Riley. Uh, B. Riley is a publicly traded company in the United States that also has partnerships in, with firms like us to provide capital um, in uh, across Latin America and so on so forth for certain acquisitions. Um, so yeah, so as Marisa was mentioning, I mean, it's uh, we've seen some you know some kind of interesting opportunities that are coming out of out of COVID. Um, in particular, in Brazil, you know, the, the, you know the. The recuperation of this year and the 2021 of the you know various sectors. I mean, we're seeing construction, you know, um, and other sectors. It's been it's been quite aggressive. You know, there's a lot of kind of activity there, but there are sectors like retail and so on and so forth that have really been lagging, and there's just a lot of distress activity in in, in those sectors in general. And that is where we've been focusing, right? Um, currently, for example, we control a factory in Brazil. Um, that is has you know this kind of is living this to the economy. We sell to the local market and uh, in the in the in the food industry and so on and so forth. Um, and that has been you know that is not doing too well. And then yet we have a forty percent of our business uh, we are um, a produce for the agri- for the agricultural sector and the agricultural sector with hard currency and so on and so forth. That has actually been doing well. So this kind of kind of shows like that the economy of the of the economies that are that are. Um, present in Latin America. Um, again, um, we just, you know, we are in non-growth investors and we do not look at, uh, at, at growth situations in the country. We look at, at a more on uh, special situations and distress. So some of this, uh, all that has been going with COVID um, has been, in, in essence, kind of, uh, quote unquote, a good market uh, for us and what we're seeing. Now, as you mentioned before, Mauricio, um, as we are seeing some of the economies emerge, again, not evenly, but you know, we're looking at some of the capital markets activity that was going, that's been going on in Latin America. For example, in Brazil, 
capital markets activity has been, you know, two times where it was in 2019 and 2020. Uh, in terms of number of deals, we had around 26 deals this year uh, in 2020 versus nine deals in 2019. Uh, this year has already been strong. So um, again, we see some some recuperation um, and we see some, I mean, you know, there will be opportunities for growth investors like, um, uh, as, uh, as, as what I can tell from what he was mentioning. But at the same time, there will, it will be uneven, you know, and there will be still be situations like in Mexico, for example, where um, banks are not being supported now as of March or April by the, by the government and so forth. So they will have to actually write down some of the loans that they have to Mexican corporates, which will indicate, you know, uh, potential sale, uh, selling of NPLs, non-performing loans and so on and so forth, which, um, you know, will open up a, you know, more active asset class for those type of investors. So, uh, yeah, look forward to engaging with that, with the rest of the panelists. Thank you, thank you, that's great. And uh, let's move now to, to Victor Savia. Uh, Victor is, uh, is a scientist, uh, besides being an entrepreneur, and he's uh, the CEO of Brookerware, and he also has a, a, a large experience in developing uh, software for, for the capital markets. So what's your view uh, on this, uh, Victor? Oh, thank you, Mauricio. Um, nice to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, well, the title of, of this meeting is Resourceful, Resourceful Latin America. Uh, I think we have been living in Latin America of giving away our natural resources over centuries uh, in exchange for technology. And I think it's time to turn this model around. We need to take the lead in exporting knowledge instead of cows, minerals, soy, using our natural resources for ourselves and make, make our living of technology. Um, software is eating the world. Uh, almost any device right now from the tiniest to the biggest machine uses software of, of many kinds. Um, and Latin America, Latin America should be producing more of it. Why? because when you export software, what you're really exporting is knowledge, and that pays off today. We came from a world not so far away where top tier companies were oil, cars, tobacco, um, but today they're all te technological giants. Um, why? Because it's a product that you can get exported using a cable, an antenna. It doesn't pay custom taxes. It, does, it doesn't have a, a Hilton quota like cows, um, it gets to the clients without entering through a port or an airport. Um, here in Uruguay, for example, software is the third more, most important export segment representing 2.5 of the GDP, uh, that is 1.5 billion. And today, information technologies produce half of the revenue of cattle and soy together. That's it for me, not enough. It won't be until it gets to by first, by the by far. Um, the good news is that it's growing each day, this segment. Uh, and, and one huge sign of that is that an, the employment rates in software developing is negative. So uh, the question is, how, how do we, we get there as a continent? How do we, what, what do we, what do we need to change in our product matrix into, into to get into technology? For, well, first we need to get our people prepared to do that. Uh, and I would like to bring here the One Laptop Per Child initiative uh, that has come here like 10 years ago and it hit like 400,000 students, the um, 2,100 uh, teachers for primary school, they were given a laptop for free. Uh, not only that, that but um, they, they, they built the infrastructure um, necessary for those laptops to act as a tool for new opportunities for the younger generation. And that uh, has, has gone in an impact uh, that's going great. And, and it's an initiative that, that is going in Peru in Argentina, in many countries in Latin America, and I think it is a way to go. So the question is, um, 
when you see the whole reality here in Latin America, why you should give a laptop to a child that is cold and hungry instead of giving him food and shelter? Um, and the answer is, you shouldn't have to choose. You need to find a way to give him both because with food and shelter, you're taking care of the short term. But to really break through the poverty cycle, you need to invest in the child in the long run. And that only can happen if you give him the tool to thrive. Um, one other thing that I see right now that is happening in the world, not only here in Latin America, is that the pandemic has accelerated the remote working. Everybody works from home right now. And today, uh, the title of this conference uh, is about natural resources. And each day, with more emphasis, it doesn't matter where you live to work in some place. There are two different things where you generate your income doesn't necessarily need to be the place where you spend it. So two lines. One, our people should be prepared to work in a world without leaving our cities. And we should be open to attract people from other countries into living here and spend the money they make, they make somewhere else. Why in Latin America? This is the title. People will choose to live here because they can have better quality of life and natural landscapes, which are one of our most precious values to make a difference. We have mountains, deserts, forests, beaches, all natural diversity. Trust me, this is will be the difference for living for somebody living in it and stressed out in big and expensive cities. Um, why should it be better? I think to burn our Amazon forest to ashes, to grow low quality crops, instead of having those people living out of exporting their own knowledge and preserving that threshold as one of the most wonderful places to visit. Places to visit. Uh, but for bringing those people from outside and keeping our own talents, we need to give them not only high speed internet, and amazing natural landscapes. We need to provide political and social stability. I, I quite agree with Lloyd with that. Um, security, the necessary framework for them to choose our beautiful Latin America. And that will be a, a whole challenge because there are some countries going in that way. Um, for example, in Latvia, uh, they give you a, a, the, the resident effectively immediately just showing up, you have a remote contract digital nomads, as they say. Uh, and we as a whole country, as a whole continent, we should be playing this game right now and attracting talent and keeping our own talent here living and spending their money in, in, all, in all of Latin America. And, uh, and talking about that, uh, uh, Victor, and, and if the, the, the other ones also want to comment on this, uh, when, when you say about the whole continent, what do you think is the, the 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 capacity or even the feasibility of the countries here to coordinate uh, among themselves to 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 achieve these goals? Uh, oh. Or, or, or oh, right. if you want right. to say I, I, something I, about about the the Mercosur, the Mercosur, for yeah, for <laughs> example, yeah. I have a lot. I have a lot of things to say. Well, first of all. Um, I think if, if there will ever be any kind of coordination, it will it will never come from our political system, because uh, I don't know if politic politics are the same uh, everywhere, but here that they they are so left and right skew. Like uh, I won't talk to you because you you're you're thinking different than me, um, and they're thinking always in the short term. You know, like. Uh, many times I think like like the, the, our political system is always thinking on the next voting and not thinking on the long run or uh, and, and and the kind of integration we, we should have. So if it's gonna be some kind of integration, I think it will come from from think tanks, from other types of organizations that won't necessarily be be in the political system. Yeah, I do agree with you somehow, and this this is part of what we are doing as a think tank uh, at e break yeah, here. Sure. Yeah. Now, what what are your views on this, uh, uh, Wilbert and Lloyd? 
yeah, I mean, in terms of the uh, the integration and also the the driving of innovation and uh, just cooperation, I also see it very very much like uh, uh, Victor, right? I don't think that's going to come from you know political system. I think that in general, I think uh, governments in Latin America have very low effectiveness. Um, obviously, you know, yeah, they're important to be engaging with just because they have the capillarity and, and, and the distribution system, you know, like an educational system, for example, which I've been studying here at school. But um, but they have very low just effects in general to get anything done. So, yes, I think that is much more coming from private industry like, without the you know, you can, it can be, you, you cannot not engage Pervasiveness, as I have, pretty much agree with you. From from my perspective, I think that the lasting change comes through treaties, um, uh, because they're they're generally, I mean, depending on the on the political system, but they're generally much harder to to repeal, right? Um, you have a, a treaty in place that, that, that that's signed by both sides. Repealing that is a is a significant international uh, declaration rather than a rather than a local political action um, and so you know in our interactions with, with governments we are always pushing them to to use their time in power to agree treaties that will that, that will outlast them and and those treaties can can you know will last for, for generations but of course as you rightly pointed out uh, and we've seen in the United States, for example, that uh, if those treaties are un unpopular politically, uh, in the short term, they'll never get done. Yeah, I, I do agree with this. And actually, th th there was something that was happening here, at least in Brazil. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, that uh, I, I think the political situation was so, so messy in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, I don't know if uh, everybody knows this, but uh, we've changed the presidents in, in, here in Brazil. Like uh, uh, we, we had like three presidents in, in two years. No? So because we had Dilma Rousseff and then um, Michel Temer and then uh, Bolsonaro right now. And uh, we had the impeachment uh, during this time. And uh, what happened was that uh, this, this first layer of the political system was so messy that what happened was that was there was a, like a detachment of the of of these layers inside the political system, and so whenever we look right now inside the ministries, uh, we have like this 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 technical layer inside the the, the, the our bodies in the ministries. Uh, that they are they are uh, right now working by their own. You see, they they they, they like for, they they forgot about their <laughs> the, the heads of states, and they are doing the, their work you now. So, and and we we saw this uh, happening uh, uh, whenever we are talking about, for example, the the, the treaty with the, the European Union, because uh, this started uh, to to be negotiated like uh, in this in this last round. Uh, during the the presidency of uh, Dilma Rousseff, and during all this cri crisis that happened during the impeachment situation and the cha the two changes of presidencies that happened, they simply uh, get on working and uh, they they forgot that this was happening and they, they said, "Well, this is important for the country and let's let's do the work that we need to do." And then uh, the, 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 the strength of the, the private sector and the think tanks, like, uh, like Victor said, uh, it, it was very important for, for, for giving support for this technical team, for them, uh, to be able to, to know which direction to, to move forward. And, uh, I think this was a very interesting phenomenon that we said here, because actually this kind of, uh, increased the, the strength of this, this, uh, technical bodies inside the government. And this kind of lasts uh, uh, at least until now, no? And uh, this probably could be like a, a sort of an answer to this. I don't know if uh, something like this happened in another country here in Latin America, but this uh, this is a phenomenon here in Brazil, uh, at least. I don't know if you have any any uh, perspective like this uh, in other countries. Well, um, 
I, I quite agree that that a treaty will will be will be the way to to get two countries into into working together. But um, what what I, from my perspective, what what I see is twenty years we've been doing that between Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Um, the outcomes were not that great. Uh, and talking about the, the relationship with the, the European community, uh, it has been like five years that they are negotiating there. Um, right now, they're, in, they're stuck, they're, there's nothing there. So uh, when we talk about, well, and then we're talking about negotiating with somewhere, with, with someone else outside of, of ourselves. So um, I quite I, I quite see a, um, a fail in our political system into getting get, into getting together and and doing things uh, in, in the commerce that that, that can make um, a stronger muscle into into negotiating with the world. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, and another thing that I, that I always uh, take up here is the, the the quality of the business environment itself, uh, including the the the, the, the political issues. Um, because uh, um, I I really don't believe that only the uh, we we setting, for example, uh, an international treaty uh, could solve could solve everything because. Um, for example, what, what, are, what is the appetite for investing in, in Latin America right now? Uh, if uh, we considering, if we consider all the, 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 the political issues that we are seeing in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, in, in, in all these countries here, um, how, how, do, how do you see, for example, there in, in European Union, especially uh, Wilbert and uh, Lloyd, uh, uh, how do investors there see like the risks in investing here? If we had we had a treaty already signed, and uh, would this solve the matter, or would they still be like uh, with two feet back, uh, waiting for something to happen here to to improve the quality of the business environment? I mean, I think you can. Ultimately, we're, we're looking at the risk to the investment over the life of the investment, right? Um, so the, 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 the analysis we're doing is, okay, this is, this is the situation, the date that we're going to, to make the investment. What could change between now and, the, and, and, and exit? Now, if there's a treaty in place, we can probably get comfortable on whatever that treaty is comfortable, whatever that treaty is, is covering, that, that won't change. Clearly, you know there may be other um, uh, there there may be other areas that are important to the investment, such as employment law and, and that sort of thing. That uh, uh, if I'm sort of you know that uh, that Wilbur was, was talking about how they were engaged in distressed debt, I mean that's a, that, that's an area where um, uh, where these sorts of domestic laws make a huge difference, um, and so. Yeah, I understand what you're saying in that uh, that a treaty is not going to solve anything, everything, but it's it's certainly going to take a lot of risk off the table. Um, and if you were to put this, the foreign direct investment population down um, uh, in, in and order them in terms of risk appetite, you would end up with a bell curve. Um, and uh, depending on what on on what happens in the country or what's likely to happen in the country. You know, more the, the the more that you can tie down as being relatively certain, the larger proportion of that bell curve that's going to continue to invest. And of course, every time there is some sort of upheaval, um, uh, you essentially push the risk up, and 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 you disqualify yourself from from the right hand side of or the, a larger portion of the right hand side of that of that bell curve. Um, and it takes, and it's not forever. You know, we saw everyone said in, in, in 2001 that uh, no one would invest in Argentina again. Um, uh, and lo and behold, money came back and, well, they got burned again. Um, uh, but it, it takes a while to, to, to rebuild. Uh, and this is, this is a source of, of an ability to catch up in terms of in infrastructure GDP growth that will have a long-term effect on the wealth of each of these countries' citizens. So um, 
it, there is no panacea, but every marginal uh, action that a government takes to uh, to encourage confidence in, in foreign direction in foreign direct investment will increase the number of dollars because it'll you will on the margin get an investor that might not have considered investing before, but but now is sticking their hands in their pockets. Okay. Just comment a little bit on that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I don't really have a view, a, a strong view in terms of the treaties and so on and so forth. But you know, if you look at you know, it just MA stats. You know, just got the uh, MA stats this morning for the from in terms of volume. Um, if you look at Brazil, for example, which is the biggest MA market, um, out of let's say out of 500 transactions this year. 358 transactions are domestic transactions. These are domestic buyer to domestic seller, right? Uh, only um, inbound transactions, which means foreign acquirers going into Brazil to buy, buy assets, it's 100. And outbound is 29, you know? So, you know, this is like Brazil in terms of m and I don't have this for 2021, 2020, these are 2021 stats. It's a, it's a local market. Uh, uh, they're not waiting for foreign investors to come in and make court doing transactions. You know, the, the uh, you know real estate market has been super hot this year, right? Given all that's going on uh, and super low rates in Brazil, we have the uh, healthcare market, for example, we should participate in a healthcare transaction um, in in Paraná, and we have you know like nine different bidders, uh, and there has been just you know, four or five companies in Brazil that have been literally just buying acquiring a new hospital every week. Um, so I think there's a lot of capital in the countries and so on and so forth. Now, it's not the same for all of them, right? You have the same stats, for example, for Mexico. Out of the, let's say, let's call it 100 transactions in Mexico, 50 transactions of those are actually in acquisitions positions where you usually have a U.S. player buying into Mexico. Right? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it, 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 there are differences across the markets, but you know, the local markets are sustaining themselves in, in, in a way. And they are the ones that are driving, you know, local local deals. Uh, I don't know, for example, of the of the IPO activity. IPOs this year, I got numbers to, you know, in twenty twenty, it's a 40, 40 billion of, of primary capital, and there's follow ons on one hundred seventy billion USD. Most of that, um, what I understand, is actually you know Brazilian funds taking in uh, uh, some of these assets and, and taking in large participation into some of these IPOs. So uh, there's a lot of you know things being done locally. And you know, given the opportunities and so on and so forth, multiples and so on, I mean, it's actually local capital is actually taking kind of uh, a kind of care of that investment. Right? Uh, they're not waiting in many cases for, for foreign funds to be able to do this. And for example, as Lloyd was mentioning, a lot of the stress, pretty much the stress is the local market. Uh, NPLs, these are local funds. In Mexico now, we're active, we're active as well. These are local funds as well. Uh, people that know the local market, local jurisdiction, that are controlled the risk and so forth. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's just to say that uh, investors locally are not kind of waiting for foreign investors to actually be active. And a lot of markets, in some markets like Brazil, is actually a very, very local market. Okay. And as we move to the, the final section here uh, of this panel, uh, I'd like to, to ask you, like, what, what are your views uh, on the recovery uh, on the post-COVID situation? Uh, which are the, con the countries here that you see that are more prepared for this uh, recovery? Which one will recover first? Which one will have uh, more struggle to do it? What are your views on this? Who wants to start? Well... And you should be a fortune teller to, to tell that, but I, I think that there, there are countries in better position than, than others. Um, countries like Argentina, they, they have been locked down for a while. Um, they have stressed out their, their own economy that is really, uh, so well. So um, compared to some other countries, well, well, Countries like Peru or Chile, they, they have been through not only the, the, these pandemics, but uh, some some social instability also. Um, and and I, I think they, they, they will have the time to, to, to thrive. Um, 
And alongside with that, there's always um, Venezuela that is always back behind everything. Um, I, I think the countries that had cuts not um, had that that kind of pressure of the economy like Brazil or Uruguay or well, maybe Mexico, they, they will be uh, not so affected and they will they will uh, re, re, re-enter in the market uh, earlier than, than the rest. Okay. Pretty much. Let's see. But I'm, I'm not the economist guy. The, the other two, they will tell you better than that. <laughs> yeah, what I was saying, we were seeing, for example, um, again, you know, we got the stats from, um, we, have an, we have an economist within our team and, uh, we got the stats from EBJA, which is the National Statistics Agency in Brazil. And you know, if you look at, you know, automobile sales, for example, in Brazil, year on year, they're up 34 percent. It's huge, right? Uh, if you look at uh, new capex for machinery and so on and so forth, it's up 33 percent, right? Uh, so you're seeing a lot of that. It's again, it's not even, uh, but you know, like in Brazil, we have the lowest rates we've ever had in you know 10, 15 years, right? So people are taking care of that. Uh, you know, things, you know, just a kind of an analogy in our factory, for example, uh, we're getting rates from Bank of Brazil, which is the National Development Bank, the National Bank uh, not the Development Bank, that's been the asset, and we're getting rates of 4%, 4.5% for equipment. You know, last year, that was two years ago, that was 14%. So, I mean, that's kind of driving a certain part of the recovery, at least for us, what we're seeing in the market locally, right? And that's actually driving deal making as well. Okay. So let me add one thing that I was thinking about right now is that something that, that is important is the infrastructure you, you had before pandemics. Um, because th- there were countries in Latin America that were going fast and faster, fast, but they were not investing in their in- own infrastructure, safety net for people, uh, healthcare, education. They, they were just growing fast. So uh, I think that the the countries that will recover first will be the ones that, that had that safety net for their people and and they the, their their own people didn't fall off that, that hard. You know? Okay. What about you, Lloyd? What what are your views on this? Is Lloyd there? Can you hear this? Sorry, guys. Okay. My, uh, no my, my internet cut out. So what are your views on this, about the recovery of the economies here? Uh, I think that we're getting a nice large bump from this, from from uh, uh, from both you know, the, the limited stimulus me- measures that have been tr- introduced and from some of the rejigging of the economy. Uh, I think that uh, that that yeah, the, the the move to remote working, uh, and this is worldwide, uh, has created winners and losers, and the winners are driving the economy forward, and the losers are, uh, f- to a large extent, zombies, and we've not we've not quite seen uh, the last of it yet. Uh, I think that there is um, that there will be no sustained recovery. Um, you know, a, a strong. There will be continued to be flashes in the pan, etc., and inflationary recoveries, um, but no sustained recovery until uh, un, until vaccination rates have climbed significantly um, in in Brazil and uh, particularly, but also through the rest of, of Latin America, um, and uh, that's going to uh, and that's also dependent on you know no new variants making those those vaccinations useless. Um, so, you know, from from our perspective, we're we're projecting that inflation will continue and accelerate. Um, we're projecting that uh, uh, that demand will d- demand will be very sector growth will be very sector specific, um, and that there is um, good money to be made in uh, in in backing the winners, and that that foreign investment can can fuel growth. Uh, to get to, to 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 pull these economies out of the rut. Okay, that's great. 
Okay, so we have uh, just a few more minutes before the, uh, we end the panel. So I would like to ask uh, if uh, you guys have any uh, further comments uh, or final words to say. Well, um, just a final remark. Uh, just to stress out what, what I've been telling at the first of the, of the, of the meeting. I think that uh, if there is a way out for Latin America, it won't be for giving away our natural resources. It is by keeping them um, and cultivating them and making our money somewhere else. And what I see as the first um, source of income is knowledge and knowledge exploitation and technology. So. Uh, I think we, we should be working in that way uh, to get a better Latin America that has more prepared people to the world and can bring um, and can bring people from outside to live in here and spend their money here uh, and, and enjoy our beautiful place. Okay, that's great. I mean, what I would just say is, again, uh, is, I mean, the, the region will come back. I think it's, it's going to be uneven. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer than, uh, you know, the U.S., for example. A lot of people are vaccinated or here, you know, I'm, I'm in Boston, people are walking around. But at the same time, though, you know, they're not, you know, investors in, in a local economies in Brazil, but like in Brazil and Mexico, are not waiting. Uh, there are certain sectors that are already ramping up quickly. And uh, others, others are not. And in particular, certain governments were financial support. this ending, for example, in Mexico in now in uh, March and April, which will drive a lot of NPL growth, uh, NPL uh, sales, and so on and so forth. So there will be you know uneven opportunities, you know, distressed at the same time that other sectors will be growth opportunities. And so on. Okay, I, I'd say I, I see things very much the same way. Um, uh, so you know the the Last thing I want to say is that you know we at Athene want to be part of this uh, of this recovery, and we want to part, we want to back the winners. So, um, you know, those that that want to talk to us about doing that, whether that's in direct infrastructure investments, uh, uh, investments in uh, backing NPL acquisitions to try and free up the banks, um, or uh, investing in 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 people who are raising uh, funds to uh, to drive growth in Latin America. We are are open to to assist and invest alongside you, um, and we believe that while, uh, as Wilbert said, it, the growth will be uneven, we're here to to to, to back the winners, um, and ultimately a rising tide will lift all boats. Okay, that's great, guys. Well, I thank you very much very much for all this uh, insightful information that you brought to us today. Uh, I, I do believe that everybody that that was watching and will be watching this uh, this panel afterwards, uh, we will appreciate everything that you brought to the table here, and I uh, hope to keep in touch with you, and uh, let's enjoy the rest of the Orazis event. Okay, so thank you very much, and see you thank soon. You. Thank, thank you, Mauricio. You so you've been a great host. Thank and you, thank, thank you guys you. For, for this wonderful meeting. Thank you, Marisa. Yeah.